All right. Hey, go ahead and stand up. We're going to read through a passage of Scripture together. This is from John chapter 4. And yes, that says 1 through 42. So hang in there for a second. And uh, let's read this amazing story together. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't go get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. Fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, Jesus, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months till the harvest? Well, I tell you, open your eyes and look to the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and, a harvest, and, and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and the other reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. 
And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that we don't have to just stand in a room and grasp at concepts and think of big ideas and try to understand God. We don't have to just sit here and, and, and figure out who can speak the best or who can say the most important sounding thing, but that we can just move to the side and read something about your character, read something about who you are, read the story of your life on earth, read how you lived, experience your love. Father, today I pray that the message of Jesus Christ in this story would do exactly what it was intended to do thousands of years ago when it was written down for the first time, to show everybody who comes encounter with Jesus that life is supposed to be more and incredibly wonderful than whatever it is you're experiencing without him. Father, that we are supposed to start to see every single human a certain way that we would not see unless you gave us a lens to see them through. Father, I pray that as we look at this story that we would not just get sucked in to some of the historical ideas and, and some of the the cultural ideas, God, but we would understand that this message, this experience that you had with this woman 2,000 years ago, written by a man named John who spent a lot of time with you, God, that you would see, we would all see today that this is for us. This is for us today. This is for us to learn from. This is for us to grow from. Father, help us not to be just hearers of the word, but doers of the word, people who take what you wanted us to take and metabolize it into action, Father. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. My question for you today is very simple. Who do you keep at a distance? Who do you keep at a distance? And the answer to this question can be found in some of the most obvious things that we do, the places that we go, the people that we spend the most time with. By default, whoever we don't spend time with, you know, those, those people are the ones that we keep at a distance. But I want you to dig a little bit deeper than just thinking about who you're not around all the time and ask yourself the question, why am I not around them? Or who do I purposefully keep out of my life? Or who do I purposefully keep at a distance? Because in my mind, I think, I, I understand that God loves everyone and I'm so glad that God loves them or they or those people. But if you really had... Uh, an opportunity to open up your heart, if you really were, were judged, if you really were tried, if everyone could see where your heart stands in relationship to maybe a certain person or a specific people group, that we would all, if we were honest, we would say, there is a group of people, there are people, there is someone who I purposefully keep at a distance. I keep them away from me. And ultimately, the, the next question becomes, why do we do that? What is it about them or they that, that pushes us away from them? Maybe it makes us uncomfortable. Maybe we think that something's wrong with them. Maybe we think that something's wrong with us. Maybe we think that those people don't know what they're talking about and associating with them makes me feel guilty by association. Whatever it is, I mean, one of the most obvious examples of this is, is just politics. Just this idea that there's red and there's blue and if you're not one of me and you don't agree with me, then you're over there and we just can't associate. And there's some crazy reality that red and blue kind of becomes black and white. And if you agree on this issue over here politically, then we are just totally mutually exclusive as people. And you feel that. I'm sorry. Be honest. You, you, you're there. You look at certain groups of people and you keep them at a distance. Your in-laws. <laughs> this happens every way. A, a co-worker. Something where you say they are over there and you, you might justify it, you might rationalize it, you keep them at a distance. And in your heart, you just, you just don't want to go there. You just don't want to be around them. You don't want to be near them. The scariest version of this is when they are just wrong. You think they're wrong. You think that group of people, they're more wrong than I am. They, 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 
man, just, just stop for a second and just wake up. Every person, wake up, wake up, your, alert yourself right now. Do you actually think that any other human is more wrong or you're better than any other human? Be honest because the answer is yes. We do. And here's how we know. Because we intellectualize it. We just, we basically do this. And this is something that I see the Christian community do all the time. And it's starting to get on my nerves. Like genuinely I'm starting to get frustrated with the, the Christian community and myself and how I do this. I walk around and I might see a group of people or a per- and go, oh, them, Cincinnati Bengals fans. <laughs> they are wrong. They're using the colors wrong. Stupid uniforms. I mean, just whatever. You grew up in a house that's a Cleveland Browns fan, and it's just like they are wrong. And there's something very funny about that, but there's something when you take it into the political realm or you take it into the racial realm or you take it into your family groups or people groups or whatever it is that you do where you actually think that, you actually believe They're worse, I'm better, and I just want to share with you, that is not a Christian idea. That is not a Christian notion. That is not a Christian um, pattern. that's That's not the heart of Jesus. One of the things that we have to do when we come together on Sunday is we have to cut out all of the crap of our lives and just look at Jesus, right? Just look at him. Just look at Jesus, man. Just just stop with everything else. We want to know about God. We love the idea of talking about God. But God said, you want to talk about me? Then talk about Jesus. You talk about Jesus, you talk about God. You look at Jesus, you adore Jesus, you think about Jesus, you observe Jesus, you're looking at the heart and the beauty of God. And every single one of us is in need of a shake up. More than ever, we need a shake up. We need to stop thinking about groups of people where we actually get something that moves into our bones, an emotional experience when we're around or we're proximate or we're talking about a certain group, a certain person, where something happens in our hearts where we distance, we cold. We put them down in our minds. We do this. I do this. Please don't play church with me today. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about and you you do this. You do this. Oh, if we don't do this, we can we we're done for the day. There's nothing else to talk about. God's invasion of planet Earth is really like an invasion of the human heart. And inside the human heart, the heart of, of, of humanity is like a map. It's like the world. It's got different nations. It's got tyrant leaders. It's got benevolent leaders. It's got good people and bad people and people behave well and don't. And the whole heart is like a nation. And God stepped down as a king of hearts into the map of our hearts and decided that he wants to be the king of it all and change the way things go. I've been watching uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy with my boys, they got excited about it. And Middle Earth, Middle Earth and all the different Mordor and all the different things, that's a picture of the human heart. It's a different way to think about it. God wants to change our hearts. He wants to change the way we're set up politically in our hearts and our minds, socially, culturally, the way we view children, the way we view women, the way we view each other, the way we view people that behave completely differently than us. He came to revolutionize the human experience and soften us and give us clarity about who is king and who is not and how we should treat one another by looking at the king who is the sacrificial pace setter of humble love. That's that's, that's what we all need. Don't we need that? Don't you want that? Don't you want something new? Aren't you sick of it? Yeah? Come on. Seriously, I I need a little response. Okay, it's Columbus, Ohio. Football's too far away. Wake the heck up. Are you guys with me a little bit? Seriously, I'm tired. I, I like, ah, 
I'm frustrated because when I look at Jesus, I don't see me. And I certainly don't see any of you. <laughs> Let's just talk about this passage for a second, okay? There's a couple of amazing things that are happening in John 4. The end of this passage tells you what the entire book is about, and we'll talk about that. But when Jesus says these words, and I remember when I was in seminary, I had a, a, a professor who took the Greek translation of when he says, I, I, I have to go through Samaria. In the Greek, it's like this idea that's like, I must, I need to go through Samaria, which is like very intense, and there's a ton, of, a ton of gravity. Basically what Jesus is saying is that I have to go there because God wants me to go there. I need to go there because there's something for me to do. There's actually like a job to do. And then you take both of those words and you put them together, and it's like he wanted to go there. He's like, I have to go there. I need to go there. I want to go there. I want to go to a place that is extremely dangerous. That's the thing about Samaria. Now, if you grew up in church, you heard about Samaria. You, you heard about it, the Samaritans. There's a lot of different things you can learn. But one of the things that I learned recently about Samaria, which really gave me a, a heightened perspective of this passage, was that Samaria was located between the north and the south kingdoms in Jerusalem, Israel, in that, in that region. And ultimately, when the Israelites were taken into captivity, years, hundreds of years before the time of Christ, they were, they were taken there and there were, were kind of stragglers that were left in the region. And ultimately, the most cultural game of move your feet, lose your seat started. Where the Jews were moved out and then there was a group of people, some of them were Jews and some of them were people from other you know, surrounding areas. And they decided to, to take up the middle of the region and say, we're actually the real Jews. And they called themselves the Samaritans. So what happened is when the Jews, because of a bunch of different things that happened in exile, got sent back to the region, they, they come in and there's a bunch of Samaritan people who are saying, oh, you guys, you guys left. This is, our this is our territory. We're the real Jews. We're the real people. We're the ones who God really loves. We're the, we're, this place right here, this is the mountain of God. Not down there in Jerusalem. This is the mountain of God. This is the place. And ultimately the Jews... Very moved, very frustrated, very angry, couldn't believe that their territory had been taken over. It started tons and tons of battles. There was tons of bloodshed. There was tons of interactions that were negative. And so ultimately, Samaria became this place that when you're traveling through north and south, through that region, you just didn't go there unless you wanted to fight. You didn't go there unless you wanted a problem. It was like literally the place. So when Jesus, it says at the beginning of this passage, it says that they had gone to Galilee and they went back and they went again. They had traveled all the time. And all the time the travelers would actually go around Samaria to go from the south to the north of the north to the south. So when Jesus says, hey, I must, I need, I want to go to Samaria, he's saying, I want to go somewhere we're not supposed to go. I want to go somewhere we're not supposed to go. It's dangerous, physically dangerous. Just, just let that sit with you for a second. I mean, I have never been in a culture more crazed about safety in my life. I mean, it is all about safety. I have three little kids. I am like the dad, not like the dad. I am the dad who has, I bought on Amazon, two signs to put in my street that tell people to slow down. I am the guy that stands out with half a shirt on and like walking around with flip flops, tanned, look like I passed out, and cars come by and I'm yelling at people, slow down! You need to slow down because my children are in the street riding. And then other kids that don't have their helmets on, I'm like the helmet tyrant. I walk around and knock on doors and say, your son is not wearing a helmet. Because I'm like, I'm nervous. The one time I did it to my one neighbor, I, I told his brother, who was like five, I'm like, you need to go get his helmet on. I'm telling, I'm losing my mind. It's all about safety. And then he went and fell, and I was like, see? You need to get his helmet on. He needs a helmet on. I mean, we live right, I mean, this is just a small example. Safety. Everything is about safety. Everything is about 
be comfortable, be safe. We need to be in this most safe environment. We need to be careful what's happening to ourselves physically. We need to be careful what's happening emotionally. All that stuff is so important. It is important to be safe, and we shouldn't be unsafe. But, but what do we do as humans when we look at Jesus, and he went somewhere because he felt he had to, he felt he needed to, he wanted to, and it was dangerous. What are we going to do? What? You want me to tell you the answer. The answer is you better figure out what God wants you to do, and it might put you in harm's way. That's, Christianity is not this easy thing. It's not this thing that says, hey, man, put your helmet on and get your knee you know, pads on and go under 25 miles an hour. It is we're going into enemy territory. We're going into a, not necessarily enemy, enemy territory, but a place that is dangerous. I mean, we can, we, we, what we like to do as Christians, especially evangelical Christians, is make that a metaphor. Oh, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. It's going to be, you know, it's a little dangerous. Someone might say something to you. That's not what it meant. It meant if we go down that road, Jesus, they might kill us. And he said, I must. I have to. I need to. I want to. I mean, we should just sit in the juxtaposition of what we think Christianity is and that idea for the rest of the day. But that's hard. That should make you question whether or not you want to follow Jesus. It's hard. This is hard. What? What? He went there? So Jesus is going into a dangerous place. Jesus was a holy man. He's already known throughout the region as being a man who was a rabbi of sorts, who is known to have, um, he has a reputation. He has a reputation for being spiritual, for being moral, for being ethical, for being a signpost for what it looks like to live your life a specific way, according to God, according to what God would say. So Jesus, not only as a holy man, goes into this place, into a dangerous place, he puts himself into this kind of taboo situation where a holy man would not go into a place where he's not supposed to be seen because that's not what you do as a good holy man. You stay away from places like Samaria for all kinds of different reasons. On top of that, he goes to this well, and as a holy man, he talks to a woman. And talking to a woman in this culture was very risky. Ultimately, only husbands would talk to their wives. And if another man would talk to someone else's wife, it would be questionable. Why are you talking to my wife? You know, it's not the way it should be, but it's the way it was. They were viewed as, you know, second class citizens or property. And ultimately, a man who would talk to a woman could be viewed as a man who's actually trying to move in on a woman. And then a holy man would never go sit and talk to a woman because the the possibility of actually falling into temptation or even the perceived idea that he was doing something immoral could happen. So Jesus, he is going into a physically dangerous place. He goes and talks to a woman, which was basically culturally unacceptable unless it is your wife. And then on top of that, he's this holy man. He does this risky thing in this risky place, and he talks to a Samaritan who in that culture it's not honorable. That is like associating with the, the other team. That's the, those are the bad guys. This is, this, is a, this is a bad person that exists in this land. We don't talk to them because they are challenging our identity as a culture, saying that who we are and our history is not as valid because they are the true Jews. So you have Jesus going into this very risky situation, this very culturally challenging situation, and then he goes in and he talks to a person he's not supposed to talk to. And then on top of that, he starts to talk to this person about drinking water, which is like saying, can we share? So now you've got a dangerous territory, you've got talking to a woman, you've got talking to a Samaritan, and now he's gonna share with a Samaritan? That is like doing something that is spiritually unclean. You don't share drinking vessels, jugs, water, utensils with people who are not, according to your customs, clean. So if you share and drink after someone who drinks th that is that type of person, now you're unclean. 
I mean, this is Jesus. He goes into dangerous territory. He's a holy man. He talks to a woman. He talks to a Samaritan. He starts to share with a Samaritan. And then on top of that, she is not just any woman. She is known to be an immoral woman. So all of the ideas of her, just the perception of it being bad, get actually um, validated in that moment because she shows up to the well at noon and women never went to the well at noon. Only women who were blackballed by the rest of the other women went to the well at noon. They didn't like her. They didn't like her because she was known to be loose in that community. So she would not spend time with the other women. She shows up at noon, so she's alone. She has to be alone. She's an outcast. She's immoral. Jesus shows up in a dangerous place as a holy man, talks to a woman, talks to a Samaritan, shares with her, and she's also immoral. Now, we should just stop and ask ourselves how we view the Christian life. What are we here for? And we should ask ourselves, what one of those things that I just mentioned are the reason or is the reason that we keep people at a distance? Because that's what we do, right? Just one of those things. Just start going through them. Well, I'm a holy man. I don't want, I'm holy. I'm, I'm, I'm a godly man, so i got to stay away. Keep them at a distance. You justify it. Oh, well, they're, they're the other team, man. They, they, they've done stuff in the past that really is offensive to my people group. We've got to stay away. Oh, we don't share with them. Oh, that person, how about now you make it about them? That person is immoral. It's culturally unacceptable for me to talk to that person. If I get seen talking to a woman, then, man, like I'm going to be looked at potentially in a negative way. On top of that, now she's immoral. I mean, I could fall into temptation. I mean, all we do as humans is figure out a reason why we shouldn't be around the people who God wants us to be around. Jesus had every single reason to never go to Samaria, go to the well, talk to a woman, talk to an immoral woman, share with her every single valid reason. He should have kept her at a distance if he cared about what he wanted Christianity to look like. But what does Jesus do? And this is like my heart for this message. You know, growing up, the bracelets came out, what would Jesus do? You remember that? Anybody remember? Maybe even someone has one. Remember, what would Jesus do? I don't, I'm not making fun of you. But part of the question, what would Jesus do, is about the future. So here I am. I'm in a, in a, in a, in a whatever situation. Well, what would Jesus do? And honestly, it's the wrong question because we just need to ask, what did Jesus do? He did this. So if you're asking yourself, well, that person is a little immoral, what would Jesus do? Should I go closer to them? You don't need to ask what would Jesus do. You just need to ask what did Jesus do. <laughs> you already did it. If that person might make you look culturally unacceptable or taboo, well, what would Jesus do? You might go, mm, you know what, I, you know, I got to have, you know, have the appearance of holiness. I got to make sure that you know, I look wise towards outsiders. I got to make sure that I look like I'm not crazy. Whatever it is, you just justify it because we think that's what Jesus would do. As soon as we start to live in this conceptual world of what Jesus might do, the human brain intervenes and screws it up. So don't ask what would Jesus do in the future. Ask what Jesus did in the past that gives us every single thing we need to know about how to live life. That's what this story is about. Here's what Jesus did. Jesus went somewhere that was geographically dangerous, culturally taboo, and spiritually unholy. And on top of all of that, he shows up in this moment with these people that none of us would be around for whatever reason we decided. And he does what? He offers her water. He does it in a sophisticated way. He says, can I have some water? And then he ultimately says, you know, if you ask for my water, I will give you water that never, ever allows you to be thirsty again. Now, what's so wonderful about the passage is Jesus, when he says living water, is actually using a play on words. Because in that time, well water was just water, just standing stagnant water. 
Living water was water that moved and it was believed to be fresh. So when Jesus talks about living water, the woman's first idea is that definitely sounds better than this well water. I would much rather have some fresh running water. And man, if you had that, why wouldn't you give it to me? And then Jesus goes, yeah, that's just an analogy because what I'm telling you is that just like living water that is the kind you would want to drink, it flows from somewhere and it just keeps coming and filling up your cup. I am the river. I am living water. And if you know me and you have a relationship with me, then you will actually never, ever, ever be thirsty again in a spiritual sense. The part that just hit me this morning as I was reading through this text again was the part that Jesus has this interaction. He tells her, you know, he can give her living water. He has this interaction. He tells her stuff about, you know, her life and what he knows of her, and it shocks her. And then he tells her that he is the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's the Christ. And when she understands that he's the Christ, she's thinking everything we just talked about. You're a Jew. You're a holy man. I'm a woman. I'm an immoral woman. You're not supposed to share with me. You're certainly not supposed to offer me something so beautiful as living water. She came to the well that day looking for water. She had a jar with her. She showed up looking for physical water to take back with her to quench her thirst for the rest of the day. And when she met Jesus, what does she do? She leaves the well, and she leaves the jar. Because Jesus filled her up. She had something. She had living water. She had something new. She had something fresh. She had exactly what she needed. She showed up to the well thinking she needed a certain kind of water. Jesus gave her the only kind of water that he can give her, the kind that is living, the kind that makes you bubble up, the kind that makes you realize you're loved. Now, I want, I want you to wrestle with this question. Does the woman feel loved because of this idea of water? Or does she feel loved because a man who's a Jew, who's a holy man, moves into her space? She's a woman, she's immoral, and he shares with her. And the summation of those things make her feel a freshness of life that she's never felt before. Does she in that moment on that mountain bubble up and go, oh, I feel the spirit of God? Or is she sitting with the manifestation of what it looks like to be God? She's sitting with God who met her in Samaria in her brokenness, in her lost state. And when she realized, you're God, you love me, you came here, you did that, she drops the jar. What we see in Jesus is boundless love. It has no boundaries, it has no ifs, ands, or buts, it has no us's, it has no thems, it has a man who moves into dangerous space, spaces to meet people. And this is the kind of love the world needs. They need people who are unexpected to show up and tell them how wonderful they are and tell them how loved they are and tell them how cared for they are and tell them how much God loves them and tell them how much no matter what you've done, no matter the fact that you're immoral, no matter how many husbands you've had, no matter what you've done, if you drink this water, you will have eternal life. Does he say to her, change and I'll offer you some water? He says, here's some water. It will change you forever. And here's the part that we have to understand. If you grew up in the church and you want to see a movement, you want to see God, you want to see God do something, God is up in heaven going, I want to see a movement. I want to see God. I want to see you do something. Because when we do what Jesus did, 
and go to Samaria, whatever our Samaria is, you see people's lives change. And when people experience that type of boundless love, movements happen. She left Jesus, and the half-bred, immoral, impure female outcast reached a village in a day. Because he moved into her space. Because he didn't keep her at a distance. Because he went there. And he didn't just go there and put on a performance. He didn't just present himself. He didn't just drop some knowledge about her background that she was surprised to know. He went there and he stayed there for two more days. Jesus slept there. He woke up there. He ate with them. He was with them. He was seen with them. There was no mistake that Jesus showed up in Samaria with those people. Where are our hearts? You see, my, the way God moves in me for messaging is he starts here, right here. Like I don't, I'm like, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. I read that and boom, something just hit me right here. And ultimately in, in pastoral training we teach how to have application. You, know, you gotta like, you gotta give information and then you gotta give application. So you teach them and then you tell them what to do. And on this message, what I feel is that like our hearts are like wrapped up in like cobwebs or, or concrete and that like we just emotionally and intellectually keep people and people groups at a distance. And I just see like God taking a hammer and banging all that concrete off of our heart and getting it to the place where the flesh is beautiful and it's pumping and it's moving. And ultimately that's the process of this whole thing is that the human heart doesn't follow its own desires but it follows God's heart. And the message of Jesus and the life of Jesus is a picture of God's heart. And God gave us hearts and God gave us feet. And ultimately he gave us feet so that we could walk places and we could go somewhere. If we were meant to stay in one place, we'd have roots, not feet. God gave us feet. And ultimately what has to happen for the Samaritan story, for the woman at the well to take up a place and become an application for Christians is our feet should follow God's heart. Our feet should follow God's heart. We should take our cues on how people are loved from the way God loves people. And stop listening to your own heart. Your heart is gonna tell you no. Your heart won't go there. Your heart will be afraid. Your heart will judge. Your heart will justify. But if you just bang away the junk and look at John 4, then you can go, now I have direction. Now I have a target. Now I know where to go. I'm going to take these feet where God's heart wants them to go. You know that this passage is so profound. The writer uses it within the first four chapters to make a statement about God's entire purpose for his visitation to planet Earth. Think about the passage, right? We dig into it. Jesus has to go. There's all these cultural implications. There are all these different pieces that I laid out. He has this conversation. The woman goes, shares with the people in the town. A bunch of people get saved. He stays there. He's there. His heart is there. It's all great. The end of the passage says, and the writer John says, this story, the story of Jesus going to Samaria to see the woman at the well does one thing specifically. Here's what it does. It proves that Jesus really is the savior of the world. Really? So we wanna know how we know that Jesus cares and loves and is the savior? You look at the woman at the well. 
Samaria is earth. God came here. All of us don't deserve his presence. If he was go to Samaria, he'd tell us to go to Samaria. He'd tell us to go to wherever we're supposed to go because that's what he did. And if he did that to save them, he did that to save you. He came to your world. He went into a dangerous place. He doesn't care what people think. He met you. He shared with you. And your life got changed. My prayer for us as we just shut this down today is just maybe don't ask the first question, where should I go next? Ask the question, what is around my heart? What is really there that's stopping me, that makes me keep people at a distance? And ask God to move in that and change that, shift that, take that away. And do something new in you. You should be so uncomfortable with your own sin and your own judgment. If you are more uncomfortable with someone else's or someone else's than your own, you, you are in dire straits. This is tragic. We have to see ourselves and ask God to change us. And then we can go to the well. Be the water. So let's pray for a minute. Father, I just thank you so much. Oh, God, that we don't have to like figure you out this way. We don't have to write something that we make up. You, you, you showed up, God. You showed up on this earth. You lived a life that couldn't be more relevant and couldn't have much more meaning. You showed us how to live and you showed us how we need you. You showed us a picture and you showed us just a heart that you have. God, and you are so amazing, God. You, you just showed up and you bring your grace, you bring your presence. I pray, God, that as your love brought the kingdom of heaven into this space, that, that we would just wrestle with that and we would exhibit that same truth and that same life that you did in John 4. We love you. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand and sing with us. So why, oh ye heavens, let the praise go up as the walls come. Everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Sing it again. Swing wide, all your heavens. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. Everything with breath, repeat the sound. All these children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Swing wide, swing wide, all you have Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation. children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God, His name is Jesus, sing it, oh, 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 o
here. Next week, we start the first series of the Connect season. It's called Grapes. That's me there. There's Grapes. Uh, that's next week. You want to be here for all of those. But today, as you're leaving, we have something for everybody in this room. Everybody, just raise your hand right now. Everybody in the room. If your hand is raised right now, we have something for you, and it is this right here. This was a bomb pop. I forgot that we were doing a song between Joel. I ate this. We have uneaten bomb pops out front for you. Not even opened yet. That's how fresh they are. As you're leaving, grab a bomb pop. Kind of celebrating July 7th. So uh, have a great week. We'll see you next week.